The Third Reich A look at Nazi Germany's ideology and propaganda The Nazis made sure to make use of proper ideology and propaganda to win the support of millions of Germans in a democracy which was later on turned into dictatorship. But how were they able to do this? What were their plans? How did they come up with this? Continue watching the video till the end to know more. Hey everyone and welcome back to yet another video from our channel. We hope you guys are doing extremely well. In this video, we'll be looking into the Nazi Germany's propaganda and ideology. We will be diving deep into every aspect of this topic. So if you are new to this channel, then make sure to hit the subscribe button. Now without any further ado, let's hop right into the video. The Nazis were skilled propagandists who used sophisticated advertising techniques and the most current technology of the time to spread their messages. Once in power, Adolf Hitler created a Ministry of Public Enlightenment and propaganda to shape German public opinion and behavior. Nazi propaganda played an integral role in advancing the persecution and ultimately the destruction of Europe's Jews. It incited hatred and fostered a climate of indifference to their fate. Following the Nazi seizure of power in 1933, Hitler established a Reich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda headed by Joseph Goebbels. The ministry's aim was to ensure that the Nazi message was successfully communicated through art, music, theater, films, books, radio, educational materials and the press. There were several audiences for Nazi propaganda. Germans were reminded of the struggle against foreign enemies and Jewish subversion. During periods preceding legislation or executive measures against Jews, propaganda campaigns created an atmosphere tolerant of violence against Jews, particularly in 1935 before the Nuremberg Race Laws of September and in 1938 prior to the barrage of anti-Semitic economic legislation following Kristallnacht. Propaganda also encouraged passivity and acceptance of the impending measures against Jews, as these appeared to depict the Nazi government as stepping in and restoring order. Real and perceived discrimination against ethnic Germans in East European nations, which had gained territory at Germany's expense following World War I, such as Czechoslovakia and Poland, was the subject of Nazi propaganda. This propaganda sought to elicit political loyalty and so-called race consciousness among the ethnic German populations. It also sought to mislead foreign governments, including the European Great Powers, that Nazi Germany was making understandable and fair demands for concessions and annexations. After the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Nazi propaganda stressed to both civilians at home and to soldiers, police officers and non-German auxiliaries serving in occupied territory themes, linking Soviet communism to European Jewry, presenting Germany as the defender of Western culture against the Judeo-Bolshevik threat, and painting an apocalyptic picture of what would happen if the Soviets won the war. This was particularly the case after the catastrophic German defeat at Stalingrad in February 1943. These themes may have been instrumental in inducing Nazi and non-Nazi Germans, as well as local collaborators, to fight on until the very end, Films in particular played an important role in disseminating racial anti-Semitism, the superiority of German military power and the intrinsic evil of the enemies as defined by Nazi ideology. Nazi films portrayed Jews as subhuman creatures infiltrating Aryan society. For example, The Eternal Jew, 1940, directed by Fritz Hippler, portrayed Jews as wandering cultural parasites consumed by sex and money. Some films, such as The Triumph of the Will, 1935, by Leni Reifenstahl, glorified Hitler and the National Socialist Movement. Two other Reifenstahl works, Festival of the Nations and Festival of Beauty, 1938, depicted the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games and promoted national pride in the successes of the Nazi regime at the Olympics. Newspapers in Germany, above all Der Stürmer, the attacker, printed cartoons that used anti-Semitic caricatures to depict Jews. After the Germans began World War II with the invasion of Poland in September 1939, the Nazi regime employed propaganda to impress upon German civilians and soldiers that the Jews were not only subhuman, but also dangerous enemies of the German Reich. The regime aimed to elicit support or at least acquiescence for policies aimed at removing Jews permanently from areas of German settlement. During the implementation of the final solution, the mass murder of European Jews, SS officials at killing centers compelled the victims of the Holocaust to maintain the deception necessary to deport the Jews from Germany and occupied Europe as smoothly as possible. Concentration camp and killing centers officials compelled prisoners, many of whom would soon die in the gas chambers, to send postcards home stating that they were being treated well and living in good conditions. Here the camp authorities used propaganda to cover up atrocities and mass murder. 
In June 1944, the German security police permitted an international Red Cross team to inspect the Theresienstadt, Camp Ghetto, located in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, today Czech Republic. The SS and police had established Theresienstadt in November 1941 as an instrument of propaganda for domestic consumption in the German Reich. The Camp Ghetto was used as an explanation for Germans who were puzzled by the deportation of German and Austrian Jews who were elderly disabled war veterans, or locally known artists and musicians to the East for labor. In preparation for the 1944 visit, the ghetto underwent a beautification program. In the wake of the inspection, SS officials in the protectorate produced a film using ghetto residents as a demonstration of the benevolent treatment of the Jewish residents of Theresienstadt supposedly enjoyed when the film was completed. SS officials deported most of the cast to the Auschwitz-Birkenau killing center. The Nazi regime used propaganda effectively to mobilize the German population to support its wars of conquest until the very end of the regime. Nazi propaganda was likewise essential to motivating those who implemented the mass murder of the European Jews and of other victims of the Nazi regime. It also served to secure the acquiescence of millions of others as bystanders to racially targeted persecution and mass murder. Nazi ideology was total in that it was a worldview that claimed to explain everything about the world and how it functions. At its core, the Nazi worldview was racist and biological, positing that the so-called Aryan race, primarily the North Europeans, was the superior race of human beings. Their superiority granted the Aryans the right and obligation to rule over other races and peoples for the benefit of humankind. The Jews, in complete contrast, were seen as a kind of anti-race, dangerous inhuman beings in seemingly human form. They were viewed alternatively as microbes and parasites, or as devils, that is, inhuman creatures with superhuman power. Propaganda was the operational method of the Third Reich, the idea that projected the ideology. Hitler's chief architect, Albert Speer, told the Nuremberg Tribunal that what distinguished the Third Reich from all previous dictatorships was its use of all the means of communication to sustain itself and to deprive its subjects of the power of independent thought. Hitler was a magician of illusion. The cultural historian Piers Brendan has described propaganda as the gospel of Nazism and notes that Jebbels liked to say that Jesus Christ has been a master of propaganda and that the propagandist must be the man with the greatest knowledge of souls. Hitler enacted a theory of persuasion, which he first promulgated in Mein Kampf. It is difficult to think of great historical leaders, dictators, war, lords, kings, and their like, who theorize about the integuments of power or abstracted from this an idea of psychological process. A Caesar might write a De Bello Gallico, and though there are also various other memoirists, they offer little in the way of a theory of persuasion per se. Hitler was different. Mein Kampf is an incontinent bulk crammed with reflections, ruminations, biographical extracts, and frenzied speculations. But within its seething mass, there is a complete manual of propaganda, one which is focused, concise, harsh, and pragmatic. Hitler's greatest insight, which makes him unique among historical actors, was the recognition that violence and propaganda could and should be an integrated phenomenon. War and its articulation should not be disentangled, since they were independent. The Nazis claimed we did not lose the war because artillery gave out, but because the weapons of our minds did not fire. The Third Reich represents the evolution of a partnership between masses and demagogue. A co-production, for example, the invitation to believe the idea that the Jews had simply been removed to external work camps and not murdered. What the Nazis were really saying was that their truth lay deeper than their lies and that their lies were merely a permissible methodology since the end always justified the means. In historian Aristotle Carlos's view, the identification of propaganda with falsification is misleading. Propaganda is a form of truth reshaped through the lens of regime intentions. From the perspective of the Reich, the Nazis were selling German truth rather than British falsehood. And that's all for today. Did we miss out on anything? Do you have any other insights on this topic? Did you enjoy watching the video? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Well, that brings us to the end of this video. We hope you enjoyed watching the video. Please like the video if you're not already and make sure to hit the subscribe button. Don't forget to press the bell icon to never miss another update from our channel. With that being said, let's meet in another one of these videos. Until then, see ya.